So you and Kate are um, creating the first annual Data Community Content Creator Awards. Never think of anything as a waste of time. If you're putting time and effort and energy into something, you will be rewarded with new skills, new insights, new lessons learned. For people out there who are thinking like, oh my God, like I'm coming from this field and I'm making the switch into data science. Like there's so much that I, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to make an impact. You, that outsider perspective will help you make that bigger impact. Harpreet, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. John, thank you so much, man. It is a absolute pleasure to be here. The first data science podcast I've ever been invited to. No. And it ends up being the super data science podcast. Uh, Yo, like, I, I made it straight straight out the huddle, man, to, to, the, to the end zone because um, wow. I feel like usually- You're so lucky. Yeah, I feel like you usually have to like take steps up, like do a little small podcast, then you get on a big one. I just got invited to this one, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it's an honor to have you on the show, Harper. Despite your humility and despite the unbelievable fact that this is your first podcast appearance as a guest, you have tons of experience hosting podcasts, and we're going to talk about all of that later on on the show. But first, tell us a little bit about you. So I'm Canadian. I grew up in Toronto, and I saw from your LinkedIn profile that you're in Winnipeg. So I assumed that you were Canadian too, but I discovered that in fact, you are not. Yeah, I'm born and raised in Sacramento, California, South Sacramento, for anybody listening, Valley High. <laughs> uh, so definitely an amazing place to grow up. But I've been in Winnipeg for the last seven-ish years. So Canadian permanent resident. Um, I feel yeah. more Canadian than I do uh, American. Nice. Do you have a hockey team that you uh, cheer for? I guess the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, I, re- I rep for the Jets, man. <laughs> Got to put it down for the Jets. Nice. But I mean, football is always, always 49ers. Always 49ers. 49ers, not uh, CFL football. You got into that Canadian Football League? Yeah, I've been to a couple of Blue Bombers games um, over, yeah. the, over the years. They're not as fun. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so that we're going off on a little bit of a tangent yeah. here, and I'll try to, I'll rein it back in pretty quickly for the listeners who aren't interested in the differences between Canadian and American football. But Canadian football, so it only has three downs instead of four downs. And so it means you still have to get as far. Well, actually, you have to get 10 meters, not 10 yards. And 10 meters is a little bit longer than 10 yards. But that's not the that's not the big hurdle. Big hurdle is that you've only got three shots to get 10 yards as opposed to four chances. So it means that it's a much faster moving game. Um, I think it's very exciting. Oh, and also the the clock between plays is only 20 seconds instead of 40 seconds. So everything's moving faster. Um, but there's not very many teams. <laughs> Cause it's cold, man. Like it's it's too cold to play football <laughs> during that season. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. Um, there's also just not as big of a population to support it. Yeah. But a fun fact for listeners out there: the oldest professional sports club in the world is sorry, not in the world. The oldest professional sports club in North America, so in the U.S. or Canada, is the Toronto Argonauts, mm. uh, which are a Canadian football team based out of Toronto. And um, yeah, they started as a rowing club in like the 1890s or something. Hey, that's interesting, man. There you go. Anyway, so you're in Winnipeg. Yeah. You <laughs> cheer for the 49ers, the Jets, and the Blue Bombers. Um, and uh, so how is the lockdown, the pandemic lockdown out in Winnipeg? So it's, yeah, it's cold. Yeah, so. it's cold. It started getting, I mean, it's it's five Celsius, which I think that's like, almost 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which like I'm out there with a t-shirt now because that feels amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's warm in a Winnipeg winter. Yeah, for sure. after like literally three straight weeks of negative 30 Celsius, like it was brutal. Wow. Um, but we were on lockdown pretty severe, like from October to just about the middle of February, like everything was on lock and they gradually opened it up. Um, the first let me start the last two weeks in February, things opened up to like 25% capacity. And now some places are up at uh, 50% capacity. We can go out to restaurants and stuff like that, but you can only go with people who are members of your household and you have to provide oh, identification. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. So you have to show that you live at the same address or something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, some interesting. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and so for listeners uh, who need to convert that negative 30 Celsius into Fahrenheit, that's pretty much a negative 30 Fahrenheit because uh, at negative 40, uh, 
negative 40 Fahrenheit is equal to negative 40 Celsius. So yeah. either way, negative 30 is bloody cold. Yeah. I mean, after a certain point, it's just, it's all cold. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah. So it's nice that you can finally dine in, in New York, uh, where I live, you could actually, you could dine at restaurants, uh, all through the last few months, all through the winter, but until very recently, it was outdoor only, mm. which obviously you can't do when it's minus 30. Yeah. And even here, I mean, if it's, if it's even approaching freezing, we tried one night, my girlfriend and me tried going out. It was like just above freezing. And just before the mains came, I was like, can you just pack the mains up for us? We're going to take everything to go because my girlfriend's freezing. Mm. So anyway, yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, I mean, everything here restaurant-wise, during that period, you could do takeout and all that stuff, which is great. I'm huge on supporting local. Like, like I've, mm-hmm. I am all about pumping money back into the local economy, so always trying to find opportunities to, to order from smaller restaurants and keep them going. Nice. And you guys have cars and stuff, unlike here, so you can go and just pick up the takeaway, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying this amazing episode. We've got a quick announcement and then we'll get straight back to it. The announcement is that Data Science Go Virtual number three is approaching quickly. It's happening on April 10th to 11th and you can get your free tickets today at datasciencego.com virtual. We've got incredible speakers, hands-on workshops, and an expo area that you can virtually attend. And of course, we've also brought back one of the most popular parts of DS Go Virtual, the networking sessions. These sessions are the best way to become part of our global data science community. Over the course of the conference, there will be several three-minute speed networking sessions in which you connect with a randomly selected data scientist from anywhere in the world. After the three minutes, if you like each other and you'd like to remain connected, you hit the connect button and you can stay in touch. Once again, every aspect of the Data Science Go conference is absolutely free. Register for your ticket today at datasciencego.com slash virtual, and we'll see you there. And now, let's get back to the episode. Um, all right, so you and I met pretty recently. This is actually, this is the first time that we've spoken to each other, so we've corresponded by email recently. Yeah. And the way that we know each other is through Kate Strashny. Yeah. And so Kate is an awesome person she's a huge linkedin data science leader if you haven't heard of her which is probably a minority of listeners and she was on episode 441 of the super data science show and she highly recommended that i speak to you harpreet and i looked at your profile and right away i was like absolutely i messaged you immediately to get you on the show and so that connection uh between between us of kate that is pertinent to the first thing that I want to talk about, which is such a cool thing that you two are doing together. So you and Kate are um, creating the first, I guess it's probably going to be annual. Yeah, but, I'm hoping, hoping it is. Yeah, so the first annual Data Community Content Creator Awards. And these are so cool. I can't believe that I haven't seen something like this before. Now, yes. that, I, now that I know it exists. So this was just announced like yesterday at the time of recording. The award show itself is on April 27th. And so this episode is airing early April. So you still have, you'll, if, if you're listening to this episode shortly after it came out, you're going to be able to watch the Data Community Content Creators Awards live on LinkedIn. And um, you'll actually have, so I think it's going to be April 17th or something like that, that nominations will close. So probably if you're listening to this early on after release, You'll even be able to go and we'll provide you with a URL in the show notes. You can go and nominate people to the categories of your choice. So we should talk about that. Yeah. Um, Harpreet, run us through the various categories that you and Kate have in the show. Yeah, definitely. I'll run through the categories, but I think it's funny to get a little bit of context on how this thing came about. So I was scrolling, oh, sure. I was scrolling LinkedIn one day and I just saw like somebody was giving out awards to people. And I thought to myself, I was like, do you need like some governing body to give you authority to give awards to people or can you just make it happen? And I thought about it. I was like, actually, you could just make it happen. You could just start giving awards to people. Mm-hmm. And I figured it would be, I mean, I'm all about doing doing big things, just weird, different things. 
And I, I thought it would be really interesting to take the People's Choice Awards, like, you know, add the flair and swag of the MTV Awards together with this LinkedIn Live thing that's that's happening and create an awards ceremony around that. Um, so I reached out to Kate. I was like, dude, I got this crazy idea. Um, and, and I know Kate is big on doing innovative things, just like she's doing with the uh, dedicated conference, the first, like, a, like first conference hosted entirely on LinkedIn. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, she was down for it. And so we came up with this thing, man. And it's, uh, you know, we got a bunch of categories. We got YouTubes, blogs, GitHub, Kaggle, podcasts, talk show hosts, authors of instructional, uh, technical textbooks, and author for, you know, data science books that are for the popular culture, social media presence, uh, so with YouTube, we've split it up into a few different categories. We got math and stats tutorials, uh, YouTube for machine learning and AI, and then YouTube for data science. Then we got bloggers, and we got your favorite Kaggler, whether it's a grandmaster or whatever Kaggle master that you really enjoy. Uh, we got GitHub, if there's a particular GitHub user who is just constantly doing awesome stuff, nominate them. You got your favorite uh, podcast, so go and vote for Super Data Science. Um, <laughs> Thank authors. you very much, Jeffrey. You can, uh, you know, nominate your favorite authors for technical books or for you know popular audience. And again, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Amazing, yeah. It's so some of these are ones that I'm like, you know, that makes a lot of sense, and they're kind of traditional like authors. But it's great how you split that up into the kind of technical side and the popular side. Some of these categories are really fun ones that I don't think I would have thought of, like Kaggle user, GitHub user. And even these, I'm really looking forward to these social media personalities. Um, I know that I'm going to learn from things like the Instagram category because I haven't personally seen Instagram used a lot as a way of conveying data science information, but I, I've heard that people are doing it. And so by seeing these nominees and seeing what they're doing, I could get some inspiration maybe to be doing stuff on Instagram as well. Um, so tons to learn. I think that this is a huge opportunity to see what other people are doing outside of the bubble that we live in. So, you know, when you go on, when I go on LinkedIn, I see Kate right at the top of the page. I see Ben Taylor. I see you. Uh, but there's other big data science personalities out there that I've never heard of. And so an award show like this, that's where everyone's nominated by the viewers themselves, by, by data community members, I'm going to get exposure to a much broader range than I otherwise could possibly. Yep. That's the biggest reason we're doing this is just to bring awareness to all these awesome people out there doing work that is helping all of us. Um, and, you know, we all learn from different people, different platforms. So when you go and, re and, and register and place your vote, like you don't have to vote for every category. If there's some categories where you don't know people, that's all good. But by the end of the ceremony, that one category you didn't know anybody for, you're going to learn about some new people. And that's the biggest thing that, that I'm hoping to get from this. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm going to be there with my tuxedo on. Yes, do it, dude. On sitting right here, probably in the same chair as always. Yeah, I, I, got, a, <laughs> I got a pretty good, uh, pretty good tuxedo get up and be rocking as well. Nice. Looking forward to it. All right. So um, that isn't uh, the only data science thing that consumes your time. In fact, I think listeners are going to be blown away by the variety of ways that you provide um, content to the data science community. So the next one that I'd like to talk about is the Artists of Data Science podcast. So this airs three times a week right now, yeah. which is amazing that I can only imagine we do two episodes a week with the Super Data Science Show. And I'm like, that's a lot. So three a week right now. So you've got a big guest episode uh, you've got a Friday happy hour. And then right now on Sundays, you have office hours with Ayodeli mm -hmm. from Comet ML. And so Ayodeli, she was a guest on the show, the Super Data Science Show recently, episode 449. We had an amazing conversation in which I learned so much about ethical AI, which I highly recommend if you're not aware <laughs> of the potential issues uh, associated with deploying data science models into the real world. I definitely recommend checking out that episode. Even if you know a bit about it, which I do, I learned a ton from Ayodeli, who is an expert in the space. She's writing a book on the topic. Oh, nice. I did not know that. Um, but yeah, we're one of our happy hours, or sorry, one of our office hours we had like a couple of weeks ago, 
there was heavy conversation around that topic of AI ethics and she provided a, a wealth of information. So you guys get a chance, go check that out. I think it's like the February 21st episode that we go deep on that topic. So it'll be up on the YouTube. The uh, of the episode of the Artist of Data Science. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh of, of the Happy Hour. Of the Happy Hour, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. So that's um, so those are the, the common machine learning uh, happy hours on Sunday with Ayadeli. Uh, you also have the happy hour on Friday. So tell us about this happy hour format in general and how it's caught on. Yeah, so the both formats, both sorry, both sessions, Comet ML and the Friday happy hours have the same format. That's this is driven entirely by you, the audience, and your questions. Um, so I, they, without you guys, it wouldn't be possible for me to do these types of events. And essentially, you just come in if you got a question related to the job search, question related to a project you're working on. Maybe something that you need help understanding. Just whatever question you have related to your journey in data science, this is a platform for you to come and ask that question and get some insight. We're not going to have all the answers, but we can help point you in the right direction. And you know, I think it's just a way to give back to to everyone. I think it's amazing that you do it, and it's free for anyone to attend. Yeah. Um, we'll have the URLs in the show notes for both the Friday happy hour as well as the Sunday office hours, but maybe tell us when they are and how people can sign up. Yeah. So Friday happy hour is 4.30 PM central time. And these are bit.ly links. So bit.ly and then a D S O H. So artists, data science, office hours. And then Comet ML's Sunday session is on 11 a.m. Central Time. And that's a bit.ly link as well, forward slash Comet dash ML dash OH. And that's 11 a.m. mostly just because there's a bunch of people from Europe who don't get to come to the Friday session because it's like the middle of the night for them. So I figured that would be a perfect time to host that. Nice. And it's cool because, yeah, by having them at different times, different kinds of people can show up. And, um, yeah, people sign up for free. And then it's just like a Zoom call and people can just ask questions, yeah. anything, and, and learn from the wisdom of the crowd. Yeah, it's so cool, man. There's a lot of fun. It started out with just me, like the the office hours that I did, the first like five to seven episodes was just me and like maybe five, six people. And it was this question and answer session. So those really intimate because they started asking some really personal questions and stuff. So I was happy to talk about, uh, but then slowly it just started catching on. And now we're, the Friday session is like over 40 people and people like David Langer, Tom Ives, Ben Taylor's always there. Uh, wow. yeah, Kate will stop by every now and then. Um, nice. Yeah. yeah. All those names are familiar to me. Yeah. I haven't met all of them, but I know who they all are. Yeah. It's cool, cool. to see like all of your like LinkedIn influencers in data science in one space uh, coming to hang out like for me that was like well, what is going on like this is wild like i follow all of you people look up to all of you guys and respect you guys and you're just showing up to my house on fridays now hanging out for an hour or two hours uh, so it's huge man it's cool i really really enjoy it it is really cool uh but we haven't even talked about what i think is the coolest aspect of all which is your big episode your big guest episode every week where you have authors on the program and I actually, I thought that the reason why you called your podcast Artists of Data Science was because you had these kind of these creative types like authors as your guests on the show primarily. But I learned I was wrong. Tell us about the name Artists of Data Science. Yeah, so the Artists of Data Science, it's the listener, it's my audience. These are the Artists of Data Science. And I use artists in the same sense that Seth Godin and Stephen Pressfield use the word artist. You know, an artist is someone who uses bravery, insight, creativity, and boldness to challenge the status quo. And nice. I feel like there's a special breed of data scientists that listen to my show, just like there's a special breed of data scientists that listen to Super Data Science. Uh, for me, it's those data scientists who realize that data science isn't everything, that there's more out there that they can and should be interested in more than just data science. And so for that reason, I talk to people who, I definitely talk to data scientists as well, but mostly just authors who have written books that I really, really enjoy. I'm big into like personal development, self-development, refining my character, just into all that wellness and that type of soft stuff. And I think data scientists don't get enough of that in their lives. 
And maybe I don't know why they don't get enough of it. Maybe they think that that's not something they should be involved in. But I'm I'm just trying to normalize it and make it okay for you to be interested in other things and not tie your identity up as just a data scientist. So for me, the artist data science is like the impact theory for data scientists. Love it. So impact theory is another podcast that you're kind of inspired by. Yeah, Tom Bilyeu is one of my heroes in the space. So I'm just a cheap Tom Bilyeu knockoff at this point. <laughs> but, but yeah, definitely. With a data science spin yeah. that gives it a special twist. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in time it'll grow to be really huge. And especially because you've had big name guests like Robert Greene, right? You've had some yeah. of the biggest authors on the planet as guests on your program. And you've only just started. Yeah, I just... I have all these books on my bookshelf and I was, I was like, why, why can't I ask them? Like, there's like, nobody's going to like reach out of my screen, slap my head and say, no, you are not allowed to reach out to Robert Greene and ask him to be on your podcast. So I just started doing it. And I, my response rate was just crazy. Like people started saying yes. And my mind was blown. So I've had awesome people like you mentioned, Robert Greene, James Altisher, Barbara Oakley. Um, I've had Donald Robertson who's written a few books on stoicism, a bunch of other people, man, like too many to, to list, but, you know, hopefully getting bigger and bigger names of people who I look up to who have written books that I really enjoy and just asking them questions to help us think about stuff other than data science. Nice. You mentioned uh, stoicism there. So you're a stoic philosopher. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, I would say you're a stoic, you're a stoic practitioner. Or try aim to, to be. Try to yeah. be, right? It's difficult. It's very, very hard. Um, I definitely have an affinity towards the philosophy. Uh, it just resonated me, with me primarily the last year and bit. Um, having a For philosophy. listeners that haven't heard of it, uh, so it's Stoic with a capital S. Yes. Tell us a little bit about it. I, I mean, this, it's, it's such a big, beautiful philosophy, but essentially all it's about is just, it's not Stoic as, oh, I'm emotionless, I'm cold, I'm, you know, like I have no emotions or anything like that. Yeah, it's more that's like the lowercase s. Stuff. That's lowercase s, right? Yeah. I, I'd say capital S stoicism is all about just the using rational judgment, right? Being able to pause before reactions um, and really practicing these cardinal virtues that they espouse. Um, courage, wisdom, justice, temperance, um, and training and disciplining your character, which is Beautiful. hard. Not easy. For sure. It's like a lifelong journey. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, you know, by studying these people, by reading their works and then by getting them on as podcast guests, yeah. seems like a pretty solid way to be, uh, making inroads, of course, with all of the self-reflection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's just an excuse to explore my own curiosity and then talk to people about it and then share that with other people. Nice. I love it. So with. With that, you know, with three episodes of the Artists of Data Science a week, it might sound like that's what you do primarily, but it isn't even close. We've only scratched the surface of you, Harpreet. So uh, we've already talked about the Data Community Content Creator Awards. We've talked about Artists of Data Science. But tell me about Data Science Dream Job, which is something else that you uh, invest a fair bit of your time in. Yeah, Data Science Dream Job is a platform that is a coaching and mentorship platform to help people get into data science. So whether you are switching careers into data science or whether you're fresh out of school or, or maybe you've had a couple of jobs in data science and now you're trying to take it to the next level, uh, we're there to help you along the way. So the first couple of modules, we talk all about mindset and habits and how to you know develop those in yourself so that you can be successful going forward. And then we get into all about how to um, essentially how to carry yourself through the interview process. Uh, people always wonder what skills do I need to get my first job in data science? They don't realize that interviewing itself is a skill. Um, so we help you guys develop that skill. We've also got a bunch of technical workshops that we have. We're not a boot camp by any means, but we we host a fair amount of technical content. Um, for example, I'm doing a, a SQL from the ground up course, starting from the very, very, very basics of SQL and incrementally moving up every week. Uh, we do all sorts of other uh, take home assignments, not take home assignments, but we'll, I'll help you on your take home assignments, but we've got um, projects and, and portfolio projects, examples and things like that. Nice. Cool that you've got that entry level SQL course. I'm waiting for the follow-up course, which you're definitely going to call SQL, the SQL. 
right? Can you uh, <laughs> add that, that sound effect? There? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Uh, yeah, there we go. So, yes, so data science dream job. Um, <laughs> we have great courses like SQL to SQL. Um, so uh, it's a learning platform, and you do have um, kind of small happy hours in there too. So this is so the, the data science dream job, this is actually, this is a, a platform that is a subscription platform, and it's targeted at people who might be early in their data science career or maybe looking to transition into data science, and probably even some people who are kind of mid-career, like they've had a couple of data science jobs and they're looking to get to the next level with a more senior job. So you've got uh, material for any of those kinds of people. Um, and... I think that that's, it's amazing that you do this. How did you get into it? So I joined as a student myself back in 2018. So, oh, you were, so you, so you signed up for the data science dream job platform. Yeah. Yeah. So I started, when I started making my transition from biostatistics into data science, it was early 2018. I think like I started becoming active exactly three years ago on LinkedIn. And one of the first couple people that popped up, obviously there's Kate and there's also Kyle McHugh. And I started following Kyle and joined his program in about June or July of 2018 and started off as a student of the platform myself, took a lot of the teachings and lessons to heart, made sure I showed up to all the office hours, made sure I just showed up to all the mentoring calls, asked questions and was helpful. And by the end of 2018, when I was in a position where I had multiple job offers, Kyle was like, hey man, like I'd love to have you on as a mentor which was, uh, that was crazy to cool. me. Yeah, my mind was blown. I was like, what? That's, that's awesome. And then by the middle of 2019, he said, uh, you know what? Let's make you the head mentor. And then just you know, recently, uh, like, let's make you principal mentor. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. I'm really excited. Incredible. And you're kind of showing it's all about investing yourself. You, know, you, just, you didn't just sign up for the platform and do it half-heartedly. Um, I think that that is a part of the Stoic philosophy too, is yes. to really, with anything you do, put all of yourself into it. Yes. And so your behavior there of going to all the happy hours, all the workshops, doing everything you can goes to show not only did it land you a bunch of data science job offers, but it now means that you're a principal mentor at data science dream job itself. Yep. Yep. I never think of anything as a waste of time. Like I, if you're putting time and effort and energy into something, you will be rewarded with new skills, new insights, new lessons learned. And if, if you're going to do something, then do it with seriousness and focus on it, concentrate on that thing. Like it's the only thing in front of you. Um, and I think that's really been how I've been able to manage all it is that I do. Like I cu cut out, all the other noise completely and just focus on the things that are going to inch me closer to wherever it is I'm trying to go. It sounds like a single huge piece of career advice, not only for data scientists, but for anybody mm -hmm. um, to focus on one thing at a time and to invest yourself fully in whatever that thing is. So with everything that we've talked about, about you, artists of data science, Data Community Content Creator Awards, Data Science Dream Job. Ooh, right before we transition to what you actually do for a living, which isn't any of those other things, <laughs> um, do you have for listeners, so I'm sure we have tons of listeners on the Super Data Science Podcast who would love to benefit from a platform like Data Science Dream Job. I think it sounds phenomenal, um, especially for people early in their career or looking to make that jump into data science or to the next level in data science. So can you help us out? Is there some kind of discount code or something that listeners could have? Yeah, absolutely. It's dsdj.co, then forward slash artists with an S-A-R-T-I-S-T-S -S -S 70. That'll get you 70% off the course. You'll be invited to, um, you know, take the entire coursework that we have, look at all our history of, of uh, catalog of technical skills workshop but you also get office hours with the other mentors who are far more awesome and intelligent than than i can ever imagine <laughs> uh, you know they're, they're they're amazing people that are going to be able to to help you nice all right so uh thank you so much i'm sure our many of our listeners will really appreciate that opportunity so thank you harper yeah 
Um, so as I was about to transition, though all of these things, data science dream job, artists of data science, data community content creator awards, that isn't actually how you make a living. Um, you are the lead data scientist at Price Industries. And Price Industries, I hadn't heard of it before, uh, before I was researching you, but they are an incredibly cool company. Yeah, this massive company based right here in Winnipeg, um, owned by Dr. Jerry Price, who like a freaking, like literally rocket scientist, a super smart guy, but it's a HVAC company and HVAC, yeah, you know, heating, heating and air conditioning, heating and air conditioning. And, you know, the, the Apple campus, the spaceship campus, like all the HVAC in that building is done by price. Uh, most of the Apple stores out there in malls, HVAC is done by price. So it's a huge, huge company um, doing some some awesome stuff. And they hired me as their very first data scientist to help them with a problem that they've been working on for a couple of years that they thought would be a good application of machine learning. Um, and I was able to to come in and within you know a few months, five to seven months of, of me starting, we we're able to go from data to a deployed model, just me and one other guy. Wow, that's great uh, because often data science projects don't work out. So it's great that you were able to start at Price Industries and make a big impact as their first data scientist. I'm sure they greatly appreciate that. So tell us a bit about the project. Yeah, so the project, this was for a suggested multiplier project. So the way Price works is we don't really sell directly wholesale to the public. Price works with sales representatives, sales offices, field offices, and the sales representatives in these field offices, they have a essentially a contract with us, an agreement to sell our product at some uh, specified discount amount, right? So we call that a standard multiplier. But every now and then, they will want to get more competitive with their pricing so that they can place a better bid and seal the deal on whatever job they're working on. Um, so they'll have a special discount request come in. And these special discount requests are reviewed and approved by high-level executives. And you know they go through hundreds a week of these uh, special discount requests. And so pretty much was able to wow. build a model going through the last two years of historical data and come up with a suggested multiplier that will essentially kind of be the optimal multiplier based on historical information that we think will get this bid closed. And yeah, man, it was a lot of fun and just got an email you know, yesterday from the primary stakeholder that he was impressed with, with how this model is spitting out numbers and that it's well aligned with what he would be given out. So it's one more step to completely automating awesome. it. Awesome. Yeah. That's great, Harpreet. Um, so when you're doing work like this, your data science work, when you're building a model like that, what kinds of tools do you use? For me, primarily it's Python. That's like my bread and butter language of choice and scikit-learn. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think that that would probably be the most common choice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of interesting coming from a statistics background, um, like you have, so you did, um, math education and a statistics education, uh, so bachelor's degree at California State University in Fullerton, University of California, Davis, and then a master's degree in math and statistics at Illinois State University. And so in those programs, as probably with my formal academic training, we had a big focus on R. Yeah, everything uh, was R, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, R is great. Like, I mean, I learned it growing, quote unquote, growing up. You know, when I was at Davis and I was in grad school, um, R was the language of choice. I didn't even hear of Python until like 2017 um, and, you know, picked it up just because the name Python sounded freaking awesome. Right. Did you know that the name Python comes from Monty Python, the British comedy troupe? So they have, there's all the Monty Python movies, they have a Broadway musical, and there was a TV series called uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus. So the Python programming language is named after Monty Python. Yeah, I did not know that. That is a good piece of trivia. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, only thing I know about Monty Fi Python is this one skit where he's like, fetch me a shrubbery. That's, that's the <laughs> yeah, only thing exactly. that stands out in my mind. That's, um, that's, a, that's a part of one of the movies 
Um, it's where it's a, the King Arthur movie, um, Quest for the Holy Grail yeah. or something like that is the name of that movie. A shrubbery. Yes. Um, the, it's the night to say ni. That's the one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I used to watch that movie a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Monty Python had tons of skits, um, you know, these kinds of bits that I think particularly people who knew that it was kinds of like British shows, like Faulty Towers, you know, a lot of these classic skits and classic lines like the shrubbery line. And so as Python was being originally developed, a lot of the original kinds of demo functions and demo data sets, they involve Monty Python skits in some way. So kind of interesting. Yeah, that is, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so delighted to be able to teach you something today, uh, even if it's not <laughs> in any way helpful to you being a data scientist. Um, so yeah, so you know, R and Python. So it's interesting. We we tend to learn R, you know, if you come up through a formal math and statistics training, we tend to learn that in university. But then on the job, we tend to use Python more. Um, you know, Python is, it's a, I don't, I don't want to say that R isn't a real programming language, but Python is something that it has a lot of, um, options for gluing to other programming languages. It's very useful in production systems. And so I think that's why we end up using it more, um, now as practitioners, but do you think that there's like, you know, do you think that somebody should only ever learn one or the other? I don't think so. Like, I don't take any parts in that Python versus R debate. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think data scientists should probably learn Python for sure, mostly because if you're looking to be in an organization that is deploying models into production, then Python's probably going to be the way to go. And it's a common language between software engineers, software developers, and data scientists, right? For example, right, if we're sitting here having this conversation, I'm talking in Punjabi and you're sitting here looking at me and talking in English, like that's not going to work, uh, right? We don't have like that I would common be pretty language. lost, yeah, for right? sure. Uh, but when, you, when software engineers, they don't really use R, but they do know Python. They can understand Python and you guys can have that common ground, that language to, to work together with. Nice, yeah. And uh, Python has tons of associated tricks that you can be using in production systems we had in the guest episode that aired just before this one. So in episode 455 with Horace Wu, he talked about how they, uh, for a specific real time um, model inference problem that they were having, they weren't getting the speed that they needed out of Python. So they're now using Cython, which is um, related to Python, but um, it allows you to get more into the low level C and really optimize things and speed things up. So definitely for production systems pretty cool yeah and if you're like me coming from a background where you use primarily sas and and r i think python it's like making the jump to python isn't that difficult uh book, yeah. book i'd recommend is west mckinney's book python for data analysis that's an excellent book to introduce anybody who's brand new to programming to python i think it, it walks you through the standard data structures and python syntax and then by the end of that book, you'll develop a understanding command of pandas in four to six weeks, which isn't that long. Yeah, so Wes McKinney invented the That's pandas right. library yeah. uh, for uh, working with data frames for manipulating. It's a common way of working. So data frames are a data structure that allows you to have uh, different data types in each column. So you can have, you know, the first column can be someone's name as a character string. The second column can be how old they are in years, and that, that's an integer. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have all different kinds of data types in this data frame, and Wes McKinney's made that a highly performant data structure um, in the Python library ecosystem. Yeah, and that book teaches you the ins and outs of it, which is really helpful. Nice. We actually had uh, uh, one of the first episodes that I hosted, the Super Data Science uh, episodes that I hosted, episode 437 with Claudia Perlick. She is a senior data scientist at Two Sigma, and up until recently, she was working alongside Wes McKinney at Two Sigma. Um, he now has his own startup uh, in Nashville that is funded by Two Sigma, um, at least in part, maybe wholly. I can't remember, yeah. but um, very cool. That and, is, uh, he's done a lot. Yeah, I mean that's that's cool, man. These people that that learn their craft at such a deep, intuitive level that they can then go and create things from nothing. 
right? Creating startups, like, you know, you've worked at startups, right? That's not easy. Um, and I don't know, like, can, can people who aren't, like, I'll just ask you this. So people who don't have that level of super depth in, de- in detail kind of understanding of whatever it is that they're in, do you think those people can be successful in startups or building a startup? Totally. Yeah. Great question. So we, yeah. So in the episode that I just mentioned, episode 455 with Horace Wu, um, so he is a lawyer. He formally trained as a lawyer. He worked for 20 years as a lawyer and he um, was inspired by providing advice to tech companies for so many years. He was like, I want to be a tech entrepreneur. And so he's now on to his second um, tech startup, and it's a machine learning startup specifically that um, automates aspects um, of revising legal documents. So basically, it allows you to almost magically, based on, so I'm I'm now getting into a bit of detail on this, but uh, I think it's such a cool company. Um, It's called Cynthia. And if you work at a big law firm, these law firms have hundreds of millions of historical legal documents. These are long documents. And so if you want to write a a clause, a paragraph in a contract, and you're like, oh, I need to have a a paragraph on intellectual property or whatever, you can use this tool, Cynthia, which is built right into Microsoft Word, and it allows you to look up in all of that, that giant historical database, those hundreds of millions of documents, historical clauses that are uh, most like the one that you need. So you can use a little bit of natural language, um, and then in real time, you get results back, and you can say, okay, these clauses are ones I'm looking for. No, not like these. And then it goes and refreshes instantly, and you get new suggestions back. So I, you know, so all of a sudden, so we talk about like augmenting, like using machine learning to augment human intelligence. This is a huge example where up until now, in all of history, if you're a lawyer, you've got to remember or look this stuff up manually. Um, Whereas now, thanks to machine learning, you can have these tools that can automatically assist you and give you suggestions and, you know, use the power of these huge historical databases. I think it's so cool. And so I'm not... Yeah, this guy, Horace, he still works part-time as a lawyer. He's bootstrapping the startup um, on the side. He's got a big tech team that are developing it um, and he can get into the weeds. You know, he doesn't have any formal scientific or technical training, but um, just from Googling uh, thousands of things over the last few years, he has a deep understanding of the models and the technical stack that they need to make this application happen. That is that's such a cool idea, and that's that's an important thing, right? Like, obviously, you know, you don't need to to have studied whatever math, stats, computer science to become a data scientist. Like that, you, just because you did not study those things does not mean that you can't 100%. become a data scientist. But here's the in- interesting thing that I think is really worth noting here is that this guy came from a completely different field and collided his field with data science, and then created right. this new thing, right? Yeah. Like that act of creation, I think is super interesting. And for people out there who are thinking like, oh my God, like I'm coming from this field and I'm making the switch into data science. Like there's so much that I, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to make an impact. You, you, that outsider perspective will help you make that bigger impact, right? You're coming with a whole new fresh set of ideas and whole new fresh perspective. You collide that with data science, machine learning, you can have a huge impact, right? Exactly. Yeah. By following the stoic philosophy and investing yourself in whatever you've been doing, you know, no matter what you've been doing in your life, if you've been um, very present and meaningful with things you've done in the past, um, any of those um, experiences are going to end up being helpful and influential. And exactly like, who knows, maybe machine learning people might never have devised a legal tool like this. Yeah. If, you know, so it takes a lawyer to do it. Yeah, right. That And I mean, here's a more commonplace example that I think some of us might be more familiar with, but this idea of churn modeling, right? Like it wasn't just invented because of e-commerce, right? The methodology to solve that problem was not unique to e-commerce, right? You, were, you and I, I think, come from a biostats type of background. That's just a survival model, right? 
Yeah, actually, I have, a, I have a funny story about this. So for people who don't know what churn is, so churn is when um, a customer stops. So like if you have, so like a subscription platform, like um, like your own data science dream job platform um, that you're a mentor in, people subscribe. And if they stop subscribing, that's churn. And so you can model like people leaving. But so uh, one of my first interviews, um, I'd only been out of my PhD for a year or two. Um, I was in this, I was in an interview where they had me whiteboarding, uh, and they were describing a churn problem and how I would model churn. And I didn't know anything of, about, I didn't have very much commercial experience at that time. And so I thought they were saying turn. And so I did this like hour long whiteboard exercise where like I kept saying and writing the word turn, uh, on, on the whiteboard. And I was kind of thinking of it as like turnover. Um, and they didn't correct me. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Man. Um, did you get the job? Anyway, um, that's a long story <laughs> and I don't want to we'll, say anything we'll, negative about that. Experience. All right. We'll talk about that on my podcast. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. Listeners can get all. Yeah. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, you were talking about churn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's just an example of taking something that worked in one industry and colliding it with your industry right so like you know before there was quote unquote data scientist and e-commerce company they probably hired statisticians and, and statisticians like oh wait how do i model when people are going to leave you know how, how do i right oh well i know this one thing from here that happened maybe i can apply that here and then they do it and all of a sudden we have churn modeling it's a thing but really it's just an idea from statistics called survival analysis um, so yeah, I mean, the the larger point I'm trying to make is that even if you're coming from a quote unquote unrelated field, or you're making this transition, it's not like all of your work experience and history just evaporates and is not going to help propel you forward. Um, all of that work experience that you've brought up to this point is going to help make you successful going forward. A hundred percent. Great example. Um, so are there any specific tools or technologies that you think, or skills that you think that, um, listeners should be getting into over the coming years? Like some, you have a lot of experience, particularly through, um, through the data science dream job platform and your artists of data science work. Are there, yeah, are there particular, we talked about stoicism already, um, but is there anything else, maybe anything specifically technical that aspiring data scientists or data scientists who are looking to make the jump to the next level in their careers, what should they be focusing on over the coming years? Yeah, and I'm going to say it's not going to be any tool or technology that's not going to make sense to whoever's listening to this 150 years in the future. Um, so we're sitting here talking about Python, so they're going to look at us like, what the hell is a Python? Um, so <laughs> it's not going to be anything like that, but I think just how about the skill of learning how to learn? Right. How about the skill of how to think clearly, how to solve problems from a, a ground up kind of perspective? Right. I think these are the skills that are really going to help propel you forward. Um, some of the I mean, let, let's let's not call it a soft skill because it's a hard skill. Emotional intelligence. Right. Being able to communicate with people and connect with people so that you can convey your ideas in such a way that they think that they came up with it. Right. Like you want everybody who is done talking to you, thinking that they know enough that they can go be a data scientist now, right? That's how you want to explain things to people is to make them feel smart. So if you're really trying to make it to the next level, it's not about PyTorch. It's not about, you know, picking up another programming language or learning some other algorithm. It's about learning how to learn effectively, efficiently, and then learning how to interact with people in a way that is going to benefit both of you guys. So start learning how to play positive sum games. Great answer. Uh, interestingly, so that same Horace Wu, the lawyer, uh, now machine learning entrepreneur. Um, so he also said learning how to learn as uh, his answer to this question. And I didn't mention it in that episode, but I remembered subsequently since we filmed that um, there's a company called 80,000 Hours, which is mm -hmm. really cool. They're a charity and um, they're backed by Y Combinator, so the really famous um, startup accelerator, but it was like a Y Combinator like charity, like program for charities. Yeah. So 80,000 hours is the average number of hours, roughly, that 
um, that you have in your career. And so what this um, startup does, startup charity, um, so it was founded by someone named Ben Taylor. Uh, no, not Ben Taylor. Ben Taylor is who we know. <laughs> yeah. Benjamin Todd. Uh, His name is Benjamin Todd. I just had Ben Taylor on my mind because you and I are always yeah. dealing with him. Benjamin Todd uh, founded 80,000 Hours, and it's a, it's a company that tries to... So they started off by providing one-on-one -on -one guidance on how you could have your most impactful career. And I actually, I, I did an interview with Ben Todd years ago when I was transitioning. Um, well, this was part of why I transitioned out was through this work that I did with them. I transitioned out of being a trader at a hedge fund. So deploying quantitative models, you know, high frequency trading, like using data science in financial markets and, you know, leaving and going into a space where I could be communicating kind of more openly with the public about what I'm doing and doing this kind of education and podcasting stuff that I'm doing now. And um, so 80,000 hours tries to use as much possible research, quantitative data to provide you with guidance on how you can have the most impact in your life, particularly your career. Um, and their research, I remember a research paper that they did from years ago, the number one skill <laughs> to be successful in a career and have a big impact is learning how to learn. And the mm. second thing, if I remember correctly, was exactly what you said about being able to communicate your ideas effectively. Hey, well, there you go, man. So, and, and I don't want to leave your, your listeners without any tangible places where they can go to learn about learning how to learn. So uh, Coursera has this massive course. I think it's like the most popular online course in the world. Uh, learning how to learn is the name of the course on Coursera. Absolutely wow. free. Uh, cool. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, it's taught by Barbara Oakley, who I had the pleasure of interviewing for the podcast, who also wrote a book called A Mind for Numbers, which I highly recommend uh, checking out. And there's Jim Quick's book, Limitless, which is also phenomenal. And then here's one book that I'm reading. It's actually an, an older book, but I just came across it. And it's called uh, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning uh, by Andy Hunt. So Pragmatic uh, Thinking and Learning. And this is one of the co-authors of The Pragmatic Programmer. I'm not sure if you heard of that book. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a big... Uh, so that's one of the best-selling Addison Wesley books of all time. Wow. And uh, so my so my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, is on is published by Addison Wesley. And I'm aware of this Pragmatic Programmer because, uh, well, not just... I mean, it's one of the best-selling software books of all time. Yeah, yeah. So yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This book is amazing. And uh, so I'm interviewing Andy Hunt next week. Um, the interview no itself. No way. Yeah, yeah. Wow. The interview itself won't be up until probably the end of 2021, but um, or middle of it, who knows. But yeah, getting to get a chance to, to interview, interview him, and we're going to go deep on, on just how to develop mastery and things like that. And another book for you guys is, is Mastery by Robert Greene. Um, which right. is a phenomenal book on how to just cultivate and develop the essentially just the right mindset and the right frame of mind to become a master in your field. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I've read that book. I read the entire thing. Um, I felt like some of the examples went on a bit long. <laughs> yeah, you have a tendency <laughs> to do that. Yeah. 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 Uh. But uh, but it, it was hugely valuable. And I as I was kind of going through mastery so he talks about in so many different disciplines how people have become masters of their field and the mm -hmm. process the formal process as you become a master in your field absolutely fascinating and because his examples are so in depth as i was reading it sometimes i was like where are we getting to with the point here but now in retrospect because those examples were so detailed they end up having like things that happen in my life trigger memories of those very specific examples that he was giving mm. and the lessons from those examples and so it has ended up being really helpful in my life yeah man that that book all of his books are amazing you guys can listen to uh, the podcast i did with him which is releasing on the one year anniversary of my podcast which is going to be on april 9th where i'm releasing that episode um so that was amazing yeah, we, yeah so that'll be right after this episode airs this episode should air on april 1st or thereabouts and so cool yeah, but in general, man, just that skill that, let's not even call it a skill, let's call it the personality trait that you can cultivate and develop for yourself is just the trait of just wanting to get better, wanting to become more. 
right? So just always having this constant bit of agitation in yourself, I think, is a huge personality trait. And that agitation is a good agitation, like, you know, not wanting to be complacent and just always wanting to grow, always wanting to learn, always being curious. Um, these are going to be the skills that I think are going to take you to that next level in whatever career you're in. Because um, the technical skills are going to fade. They're going to come and go. But these personality traits, these character traits, uh, I think these are lasting and eternal. For sure. I couldn't agree more. And you said it beautifully. Harpreet, I usually end the episode by asking for book recommendations, but you've just given us a slew of them and they are yeah. perfect. Um, so we'll wrap things up by asking how can listeners contact you or follow you? You have so many amazing, um, so many amazing venues for connecting with data scientists and making a big impact on their lives. I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that you're an exceptional person that they could uh, learn a lot from. Obviously we know about some things like dropping into your Friday happy hours or your Sunday office hours with Iodeli. Um, of course there's the data science dream job platform, which is probably the way to get, um, maybe the most kind of, uh, small group size impact from you, mm -hmm. but more generally speaking, you know, uh, are you active on social media? Can people follow you there? Yeah. So LinkedIn is my social media of choice. So look me up, Harpreet Sota. Um, the backslash of that is LinkedIn and that backslash is Harpreet Sota 204. Cause there might be a few of me out there, uh, but <laughs> nice, that's, nice. that's we'll the have it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. So that's my primary, uh, social media of choice. I've got a Instagram, the artist of data science, and I've got Twitter at artists of data just picked up on clubhouse as at artists of data. So find me on there. I'm hoping to, uh, to get more active on clubhouse. Um, and the podcast you can find it anywhere. The artist of data science and the website for that is the artist of data science dot fireside dot FM. Um, because my website is complete trash right now because I don't have a, a, a team. Uh, yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll catch up with you again for sure. The latest would be the Data Community Content Creator Awards. I can't wait to see it happen. Thank you so much for being on the show, Harpreet. And yeah, I think listeners can expect to be hearing me on an episode of Artists of Data, Data Science at some point yeah, as well. Absolutely, man. Looking forward to having you on. And thank you again for inviting me to be on this show. It's, it means a lot to me. It's a huge platform. Thank you guys if you're listening to this point in the podcast. Thank you for, for, for sticking with us that long. I appreciate you guys giving us your time and trusting us with your time. Uh, I just want to leave you guys with my standard farewell message. And that's you got one life on this planet. Why not try to do something big? Cheers, everyone. Beautiful. Thank you, Harpreet, and see you again soon. Harpreet is so cool, isn't he? He oozes capital S stoicism and practices what he preaches by giving his data science career his all and building a massive community of data scientists committed to helping each other succeed. In today's episode, we covered the Data Community Content Creator Awards. Harpreet's inspiring Artists of Data Science podcast with its fun and free office hours the deeply supportive and interactive data science dream job platform, and the critical skills it takes to succeed at any level in a data science career, particularly learning how to learn and communicating data effectively. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, and the URLs for Harpreet's LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram at superdatascience.com 457. That's superdatascience.com slash 457. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd of course greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, where we have a high fidelity, smiley face filled video version of this episode. I also encourage you to follow me or tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter, where my Twitter handle is at John Crone Learns to let me know your thoughts on this episode. I'd love to respond to your comments or questions in public and get a conversation going. You're also welcome to add me on LinkedIn, but it might be a good idea to mention you were listening to the Super Data Science Podcast so that I know you're not a random salesperson. Since this podcast is free, if you'd like a hugely helpful way to show your support for my work, then I'd be very grateful indeed if you made your way to the Data Community Content Creator Awards nomination form, the links in the show notes. Of course, we'd love you to nominate this Super Data Science podcast for Category 7, the podcast category. 
I'd also love my name, John Crone, nominated for category eight, the textbook category, for my book, Deep Learning Illustrated. And finally, I'd also love my name, again, John Crone, nominated for category two, the machine learning and AI YouTube category for my YouTube channel, which contains tons of free videos on deep learning, linear algebra applications, and machine learning libraries. All right. Thanks to Ivana, Jaime, Mario, and JP on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another great episode today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon. <laughs>